think once we concede that we are temporally biased, biased in terms of time, and that that bias is in favor of the future rather than the past, uh, a, a lot of interesting questions emerge, and, and, and Parfit is interested in a lot of the repercussions of that. Let's just look at three of the issues that, that he deals with uh, that, that relate to our bias towards the future. Um, the, the first question is why we are biased towards the future. The second question is whether it's conceivable that we could not be biased towards the future. That is, can we imagine a, a being like ourselves who lacks that bias? And this is somebody who would have a you know, temporally, that is in terms of time, temporally neutral view of, of his or her experiences, where the experiences in the past had just as much value for them as the experiences in, in the future. And that's the hypothetical person he calls timeless. And the third issue uh, is, given that we are biased towards the future, um, is uh, is that good or bad for us? That, that is, would it be better for us if we were not? We are, um, but it, would it be? Would we, on the whole, be happier if we w were not biased towards the future? All these questions are all, of course, related in, in, in different ways, but they are distinct. No, the first question, okay, why are we biased towards the future? There are different ways of accounting for that. The so-called S theorist self-interest theorist. Um, Parfit says, well, th they might concede, the self-interest theorists might concede that, y yes, we are, generally speaking, biased towards the future, but, but, but why are we? Uh, that's just your rational ground for it. Um, well, maybe uh, we are, but that's because we are, generally speaking, biased towards things that we can affect, that we can do something about. That is, we may have a general outlook that makes us pay more attention to what will happen in the future than what has happened in the past, but that can be explained on the basis of just a, a rational preference or a rational um, giving more attention to things that we can do about because the, the so-called direction of causation, which is the section that it deals with, beginning on page 196, that is, that uh, we care more things about the things in the future because we can do something about things in the future, generally speaking, and we can't do anything about the past. We can do things to change the future. We can't do anything to change the past. Uh, and that sounds pretty good. I mean, it, especially in sort of an evolutionary sense, like, okay, we've developed minds that presumably are things that can do good for us, uh, that those minds are concentrated on things that are possible to change is, you know, speaking good rather than, you know, if they were concentrated on things that were impossible to change. But what is Parfit's response to that? Well, the, the argument is that we care more about things that we can change than things that we can't change. And Parfit says that in some cases, at least, this is clearly false. Uh, for instance, gives another hypothetical, I believe. Um, I don't know if he actually spells it out, but if we knew, I think he talks about being a prisoner. If we knew that we were a prisoner and uh, somewhere, kept a prisoner, and, and that we were going to be tortured or we we're going to have some horrible experience in the future, and that there was nothing, nothing that we could do about it, and that if we had that knowledge, that it was inevitable. Uh, we wouldn't cease to care about it. That is, just because something is inevitable uh, in, the, in the future does not mean that we cease to care about it and care about it more than things in the, in the past. That is, even if we know that we cannot change it, we still care deeply uh, about it in a way that we don't care about things in, in the past. So just because we cannot causally affect things in the future does not mean, then, that we care less about them. Which means what? That, well, our bias towards things in the future is, is just that. It, it's a bias. That, that is, we don't 
care about things in the future more than the past because we can because we can affect things in the future and can affect things in the past. We care more about experiences just because they are in the future rather than the past. But it's a pure preference, um, not one that necessarily has, you might say, a completely rational basis. Um, but we just have a preference for things in the future that we have. We care more about things in the future. Uh, now there's another question here then. Um, okay, uh, given that we do okay, have this bias towards the future, that we care more about things in the future than in the past, uh, could it be that that, that that was not true. That is, it, is it conceivable that um, we did not have this bias? And that is, is this bias a necessary bias? And the answer to that is, is, is no. That is, um, yeah, well, yes and no. That is, in, in, in some respects, in the way that we speak about ourselves and, and the world, it would seem that that bias is built in. For instance, on page 200, he asks the question, is it conceivable that we might lack the bias towards the future? Our attitudes to the past could not be just like our attitudes to the future. Some emotions or reactions presuppose beliefs about causation. Since we cannot affect the past, these emotions and reactions could not be backward-looking. Thus, we could not form an intention to have done something yesterday or be firmly resolved to make the best of what lies behind us. And you think about you know, how those expressions really make no sense. Um, and then he starts talking about you know, desires. I mean, that is, we have desires, and, and presumably our desires are about things that we could have in the future. But he goes to some length with another hypothetical, the one on 200, to try to establish that it's not completely unthinkable that we could have desires about the past. Um, that is, that we could have the same kind of general attitudes towards past events that we do about future events, something akin to anticipation. Um, that is, in a way, it's, it's, it's absurd to say that we could anticipate past events, but we could have an attitude approaching uh, anticipation about past events, and you can look at that uh, hypothetical on page 200 and try to make that plausible. Um, that is, we know that it's impossible to affect past events, but we, he, he, he claims that, and this is the reason for his use of the uh, example of the Pythagoreans, who he says had desire, desires for something that they knew clearly, be clearly to be impossible, having to do with mathematics, and that's quite an interesting example. That it's quite possible for us to have desires for things that we know are impossible, and that they're just good old normal desires. So what is he trying to establish here? I think what he's trying to establish is that it's quite conceivable that there could be a person uh, who was temporally neutral, who felt as strongly about past experiences and who derived as much satisfaction, let's say, about thinking about past goods as he or she does about anticipating future goods. Uh, a person, this person who would be called timeless, who would be just as pained by the retrospective memory of past suffering or past bad as they would um, uh, strong at their dread for future sufferings or future bad, that is, that they would not prefer to have their sufferings in the past rather than the future. They would not prefer to have their pleasures in the future rather than the past. So this being would be a being that would be quite different from us. But he thinks a being that we could definitely imagine this conceivable being. So we'll deal with the last question in the next step.